people who read the Wall Street Journal, you know, which is still one of the best business papers in the country. Right. If, if you stick to the business section and, and ignore the opinion. And, you know, and like the News Hour has fucking... This idiot from the New York Times off that page, David Brooks. Like, I mean, Brooks and Shields haven't had a original thought. Oh, my <laughs> God, they're awful. They're so bad. You know? I can barely... Like, I can't even watch... The kind of sputters... <laughs> They're horrible. <laughs> like it's not. It's not like we got Pericles, uh, you know, debating Socrates here. I mean, right. you know, it, it, it's it's. Um, so if you were going to write this book, how would you? What chap? Like, okay, let's say. I, I would know. do a chapter like I would do two chapters on the MS on the quote liberal media or legacy media. I would do one on the business model collapsing and two on their credibility collapsing. Mm-hmm. I would talk about you know supporting the Iraq War, normalizing Bush. Covering for Obama when he consolidated the normalization of Bush. I mean, the fact that Obama never get investigated anybody for the Iraq war crimes, war. and everybody was just yeah. as pleased as punch with that. You yeah. know, I mean, stuff like that. You know, we're giving him a pass on abrogating the power to assassinate U.S. citizens with drones in other countries. I mean, what's Trump going to do with that little cherry? You know, <laughs> oh <laughs> and my God. Uh, I mean, and so, and then you've got. A, Another chapter, a pair of chapters on the rise of the right wing media mm-hmm. and how the repeal of fairness doctrine and the rise of Rush Limbaugh and the rise of Fox News and Roger Ailes. And then, you know, a second chapter on how the Drudge Report and Breitbart were the internet heirs of that. And then, you know, have a chapter on the rise of the left wing internet. Mm-hmm. And, the, and the way, you know, it starts out idealistic and whatever, you know, but eventually ends up with David Brock and Peter Dow. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I mean, they have their ups and downs. I'm not saying that they're Satan or Goebbels or anything, but they're clearly <laughs> propagandists, you know. I, I think Glenn Greenwald has his moments of, well, whatever. But. Yeah, I mean, Greenwald, you know, and I, I prefer Greenwald to Dow, but both of those guys, you have to know their agenda. Oh my God! To, to, to be able to get anything useful out of them. Yeah, yeah, you know? absolutely. Um, but, so yeah. And also talk about Huffington Post and the way that was supposed to be this liberal thing, but it became a money thing. Oh my God! It's so awful. It's like ninety-five yeah. percent trash. Yeah, it's, it's a celebrity a crap clip. and just like, oh, and you know, that thing is so bad. And Vox.com, for God's sake. Oh, you don't like that? Yeah, I think they have some good oh, stuff. Oh, I hate them. I, well, I have to deal with those assholes. <laughs> why, do you, why do you hate, I watch. why do you hate Vox? Because the idea was, we'll be this explainer of the news, and we'll use the technical powers of the internet to bring more depth to the subject, when really what they do is hire a bunch of 22-year-olds to do Wikipedia searches <laughs> and pass themselves off as if they're explaining the news with some authority. But like their <laughs> foreign policy coverage is like 22-year-old gets on the phone with State Department. It's <laughs> what he's told, you know, and you get articles like, Putin's going to get his ass kicked in Syria, book it. You know, and it's like, <laughs> you mm, know. Yeah, like, well, that didn't happen. Like, still bringing that article up. Hey, that was a great piece. And of course, the guy who wrote it has failed upward all the way to the New York Times. Oh, of course. You know, Max <laughs> Fisher. I mean, you uh, know, it's just bad. I mean, it's cynical right. garbage. I mean, they make their money on things like, here's a cat scan. You know, two people got in a cat scan machine and fucked. Let's look at the video. <laughs> you know, Eight million views later. I know. Well, BuzzFeed, <laughs> yeah, all this stuff is just trash. But it gets, yeah, you have a cat, you know, fucking a dog, whatever it is. And and um, with a with a rat on top of it, and and they get like a gazillion uh, and a, you know a gazillion views. I mean, it's uh, yeah, and I mean, and the, but you got to keep in mind that's always been part of the deal. I mean, you know, in the great days of Pulitzer and Hearst, they they made their money on things like color comics, which oh, some yeah. people, which I am a huge fan of, and that was like this art form, but fundamentally it was aimed at Homer Simpson, you know, because. When, I mean, that was a big deal. Where's the newspaper with color comics? You know? <laughs> and like, the whole sitcom form comes out of that. And, mm-hmm. the, you know, so many different forms of media entertainment, the, the, you know, later 
the, the serial drama was invented in the comics books pages, you know, and, mm-hmm. and all these things that later were big on radio and TV came out of the comic strips. And, you know, and they were yellow journalists with political axes to grind and really cynical and, you know, and it was a trade-off. They, they, they delivered some real news. I mean, they were quintessential, they were essential parts of public, the public health revolution, you know, crusading journalists mm-hmm. and Buckrakers. all that stuff, but they made their money on you know, racist cartoons. Right, and we've always had the freak shows at, at circuses and whatever. I mean, people love, you know, seeing the, the one-eyed, you know, two, three-armed boy or whatever the fuck it is. Yeah. And, you know, they love that shit. So, yeah, and um, I, mean, I think you should probably have a chapter like saying, look, there's always been elements of you know, political bullshit and cynical profiteering and, and you know, selling garbage, you know. Right, but, well, one one of the chapters... Delivery. But something's changed. So many things have changed right. now. Right. What, one, of the, one of the chapters I had penciled in here was a, a, histor- a brief history of fake news and quotes. And so that could cover all that, a lot of that stuff. And then... Um, I have fake news today, kind of like what it is is today. I'm talking yeah. about Pizzagate and you know just all the stuff. Like I mean, Trump talking about thousands of Muslims cheering after 9/11. I mean, it's just like what or Obama's you know um, uh, birth certificate or whatever. I mean, what is all that crap? So you got to get into that. I have a chapter on the decline. I had penciled in, so we're I think actually we're on the same page, pretty much on the decline of the corporate media and the rise of fake news. I have that. I, I want to get into bowling alone, sort of, like the atomization of people in this country where everybody's just in their own sort of world, like, and yeah. they don't interact anymore, they don't talk to... Look, my parents live in a... Ga- my parents are liberals, but they live in a gated community in northern Georgia, for God's sake now, with which is all, all white, it's all... You have to be over 50 to live in this community, so, and they're all, like, upper middle class or well-to-do, and overwhelmingly Republican. Cherokee County. I love this, too. Cherokee County. You know why it's called Cherokee County? Northern Georgia. That's where the Cherokee used to live until they were... Yeah. Andrew Jackson fucking sent them on the Trail of Tears. That's where it started, in Cherokee County. But anyway, um, so... Uh, but people live literally in gated communities, physically, and online. They, they don't li- even talk to their neighbors in the gated community. No, my parents, like, avoid... They have friends. There are maybe 25% of the people in this community are liberal. There are some Jewish people. Whatever the hell. And they're friends mostly with them. They mostly... The Trump voters, they, like, try to avoid them. Or they just don't talk politics or try to not talk much with them. <laughs> but, um... Yeah. I, uh... But I'm, what I'm yeah, saying is... The antithesis of the Trump voters... America. Right. What I'm saying is people have self-segregated in every way. They've self-segregated physically, and they've been unable to do that in part because of the spread of things like, well, suburbia, air conditioning, things that let people, and, and, and you know, you can just get in your car and drive into your, into your and, and hit your remote control for your uh, garage door and go in there and never see any, and people don't sit out on their porches anymore because yeah. they don't have to sit out on their porches anymore because it's not hot in their house because they have air conditioning. So no one interacts. They are in gated communities. They're in gated communities online, too, effectively. And on TV and radio and everything else. I mean, everyone's... And, but these these people come together. I mean, these right-wingers in my parents... where my parents live in that gated community, they, they'll talk all day about, you know, how great Trump is and they'll just keep... or they'll exchange that on Facebook or whatever forum and then they'll go home and turn on Fox and it's just this closed hermetically sealed epistemic whatever you want to say closure you know universe and um so i want to get into somewhat that this has all happened on multiple levels so i was going to have a chapter that's definitely worth doing yeah i was going to think that a chapter on the 90s roots and you go all the way back to the birch society in the 50s and 60s but the, the, the 90s, especially because of Alex Jones coming out of the scene in Austin, Texas with the Access TV uh, and being close to Waco and the McVeigh attack in Oklahoma City that, you know, in the 90s there was like shortwave radio shows hmm. pushing this kind of conspiracy stuff. Yeah. And, and there's a, do you know who William Cooper was? It rings a bell. Um... Google, you should... Google, research William Cooper. Okay. He was a conspiracy nut. 
he had his own conspiracy book. I can't remember what it was called. He had, he had like a conspiracy book where he laid out some conspiracy vision. But he had this shortwave radio show called The Hour of the Time that mm-hmm. every episode was about a different conspiracy book. <laughs> and he would tell the story. Uh. It never added up to anything because every episode would tell you this different conspiracy, right? Right. But it was really compelling. I mean, it, would, it had this like theme song of, you know, sirens and, you know, some kind of voice coming over like a, you know, one of those, bri- those towers with speakers on them, you know, that mm. they used to use for tornado warnings or whatever. Right, so it make you scared, make you like, you know, paranoid. Yeah. yeah, and then he would like, you know, talk you through some insane conspiracy about how the Masons want to fire nuclear missiles into Jupiter and make that a sun, you know? And, f- and like, while fluoridating so your water, yeah. Just this guy, I mean, it's like great entertainment to get down and listen to this in a kind of, oh my God, oh, this is so crazy kind of way, but people were believing it. I mean, Cooper himself got killed in a shootout with the ATF mm. in a classic suicide by cop situation, you know? Which, I mean, I don't know if it's worth doing a chapter on, why are people's brains such that they are... Well, I mean, I, I think it's the, it's the legacy of, you can trace the legacy of this stuff from John Birch and how it was ascendant in the early 60s and then rejected by William F. Buckley and others. Right, but why, yeah. why, do people are, why are they prone to believe this crap? I mean, why, why are people's brains open, very, not only open, receptive, very receptive, to believing it's, conspiracy it's, because it, it makes sense, of, whole, makes sense you know, of the universe, theory. makes sense of their lives? It gives people, order. Can't, people aren't educated enough to do critical thinking. Right, but it gives and order to... They're scared, but I think a lot of this, I think what people don't talk about a lot, people are afraid of getting old, dying, like, think basic things that, you know, and... Being alone. Yeah, and this this addresses, like, this makes you feel part of a bigger thing yeah. in a way. This makes you feel like there's, okay, so this actually goes with this, and this goes with this, so it's not just, like, random things happening, to, and, like, good things happening to bad well, people. have you read much about the Newton? the school shooting in Newton and how, like, Alex Jones was up the false flag and that the parents were actors and no children were actually killed. Right, Newtown, yeah. Yeah, and and one thing I read, I think it was in the Times, where they talked, the subject of the article is a guy who had originally bought into the conspiracy theories and, like, investigated it to the point where he realized, oh, shit, this was real. And it talks a lot about who believes this stuff. Right, exactly, why. And one of the theories was that a lot of the people who believe that the Newtown was a false flag operation are young mothers. So it's and too don't horrible. Want to believe it could happen to their kids. It's too scary. They can't wrap their brains around it. It's yeah. too horrifying. So they, they need can't to deal with sending their kids off to school knowing that if you're just unlucky, some asshole with a gun could shoot your kid. Right, it could be totally random. You can't deal with that. It's easier to, it's, it feels better and less, less scary to think yeah. this this was either not really, it didn't really happen, or that this was a specific case that was planned in advance by diabolical forces. And so, you know, that's not going to yeah. happen to your kid because that's like really crazy, weird thing well, to happen. There weren't even kids there, they were all actors. Well, that too, yeah. <laughs> you could, so, yeah. So, um, I was, so, and okay. also, that's the whole thing with Alex Jones. This, and I, I can't think of the source to aim at, but there's a whole body of theory that people who believe in conspiracy theories are people who want, they're sort of authoritarian in tendency, but they're, sen- they're educated enough or they've seen enough of authority figures failing that they don't believe the government is good anymore. Mm-hmm. But they still need to believe that somebody is in charge, even if it's, Right. Zionist occupational government. Or God. Know? I guess and you have to have a deity, too, or some, some sort, right? A big, yeah. big, big authority figure in the sky, which I don't believe in. But it is harder if you don't... Look, I remember when I went to Hebrew school and I was a kid and I kind of believed in whatever, in religion. And yeah, it's more it's comforting. It can be comforting, you know. There's order in the universe, you know, there's all this tradition, there's all this stuff. I mean, it makes you yeah. feel, yeah, I mean, it gives you a warm sort of feeling in a way around you. But, And um, there are rules to follow. And if you're, especially if you're more orthodox or whatever, whatever religion, um, you have definite rules, although they break them all the time. But <laughs> Well, yeah. But, I mean, at the same time, like, 
to me it's ironic that traditions like rabbinical Judaism, especially in Eastern Europe, there were whole, there were serious traditions of questioning. And like, you know, you'd have these whole villages where everybody worked except for the guys who went to rabbinical mm-hmm. school. And they sat around all day arguing. Yeah, and like us. I mean, everything, exactly. <laughs> We'd be and, there. Except, but, uh, yeah, ex- and questioning everything, you know? <laughs> I know. And the same thing with Baptists. Yeah. A Baptist was this every man a priest. Read the Bible for yourself. Question, question, question. And yet, at some point, like in 1908, Baptist became this absolutely fundamentalist, take the Bible literally, no break from our official dogma thing. They became the exact opposite of what they started out as. Right. And look at rabbinical Judaism. So many of those sects now have become... Like, they deliberately undereducate their male mm-hmm. membership now, mm-hmm. and, you know, under the control of a handful of these, you know, if you think Catholic priests are bad, you've read about the Brooklyn Pell yeah. scandals in the Jewish yep. community, right? Like, or uh, madrasas. Uh, these uh, yeah. these uh, Sunni fundamentalist um, Wahhabi, whatever you want to call them, yeah, uh, exactly. all and, over the world. The Saudis know, have funded this shit all over the world. But yeah, I mean, yeah. they don't they don't teach science or whatever. No. You memorize the fucking. You memorize it. I I don't think you're supposed to be questioning it. Um, I mean, no. I, I think you're just supposed to memorize it. I mean, look at the uh, satanic verses. Look what happened to Rusty. He questioned. Yeah. If you question, you get death. Fat was against you. Yeah, and, and the irony of that is, like, if you read the Quran, there's no priest in Islam for a reason. I know exactly. <laughs> I mean, avoid yeah. that. Well, I mean, if you read the New Testament, which I have, um, you know, it's nothing really. There's nothing in there that I could see that really relates to today's fundamental evangelical Christianity. I'm Almost like, nothing. And I mean, as Saint Paul, to me, the genius of, of Paul is that it's a great way, to, it's like Trump tweeting. It's like, Jesus said, Jesus is this commie, hippie troublemaker. Mm-hmm. There's no way to read what Jesus said, or whoever said it. Somebody said this stuff. You know, I don't want to get into the historical Jesus debate right now, there, but yeah. said this stuff. And it's really original, and it's really a threat to anybody in power at any time. Right. And what do you do with that? Well, you come up with this fairy tale about how if you accept Jesus as your Savior, all your problems are solved. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know? And it's like the perfect way to cover up what did Jesus actually say and stand for by by making him this God and worshiping him. Right. yeah, it's it's basically Judaism for idiots in a lot of ways because or, or lazy lazy idiots because Judaism is like no you can't just accept if you if you do something bad you have to in order to atone you have to atone for that sincerely you have to like make amends with the person you hurt you have to there's a whole series of things you have to do to to for an apology to be valid in in traditional Judaism in Christianity the way they the way it, it evolved was like you just say please Jesus I ask for you know, go to a priest or whatever uh, and, and then they had to water it down to sell it to Vikings right exactly <laughs> you know, so you know, it's like you had you had these big moments where you're trying to pitch it, you're competing with some other asshole based on who has the most candles in their ceremony. Or right. Whatever. You know, like, James, what's going to appeal to these guys who just came off of boat slaughtering people in the right. Baltic? Like, you know... This is, uh, I don't know if you ever read James Michener or whatever, but in the source, this is what, his whole theory, I mean, this was like, this was his whole story pretty much, was that Judaism was too hard for most people. I mean, and so Christianity... <laughs> Christianity was like a much easier, more forgiving version of Judaism. Like, yeah, you know, and yeah. um, it's also has nothing to do with the teachings of Jesus. They're no. virtually nothing. No, I don't see. It. So, okay, so what would you? So the title of this book uh, kind of summarizes this whole conversation. But what what would you say the the real? If you were gonna come up with a title for this book that you would propose to a book. Um, seller, I mean a book publisher. Um, what what would it be? Just to kind of would it be more of how the mainstream media is filled? Like in, I would say something like fake news. Why we're believing bullshit? And, uh, you know, not bullshit. <laughs> you know, why why are people falling for you know 
Right. I came up with, um, I, this is too long, but I came up with post-fact, how the rise of fake news, the decline of social media, and the failure of traditional media all contributed to the disastrous election of Donald Trump. Something like that. Uh, that that's just sort of the idea. Yeah, I mean, I, would, I, would, I wouldn't tie it just to Trump. You know, because I just such a limited. I know, window. but that's and a big. Uh, but in terms of marketing, though, you got to think of marketing. You know. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, I, I would think, you know, something like post fact. You know, uh, how. The Here, variation on it's Trump's world. We just write about it. You know, yeah. we just believe what we're told. Like. Here are a couple other a couple other ideas. Uh, I came back to the dark ages. Can American democracy survive in a post-fact world where, quote, real news isn't believed and fake news runs amok? Yeah, I mean, it's too long. But... I know it's too long. I know, yeah, right. Yeah. But that's sort of, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. One, one that the... I think, think post-fact, fake news, and Trump are three words you have to have in there and, and try to make it as short as possible. I, I know. Think. Well, the subtitle can be fairly long, but yeah, I know. It's like... Yeah, you still want to... Half a sentence, I think. I think you want a two-word title, and then boom, 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 boom. I mean, Never is Rising, you know, can you even say our subtitle? No. Um, <laughs> I can't even remember what it was. Netroots Rising. Netroots Rising, how a citizen army of bloggers and online activists is changing American politics. Yeah, so that's long. <laughs> right, but that's, um, that's 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 words. Yeah, I would cut that down to six syllables, but... Um, but I don't know. Anyway, I don't think that's... Actually, um, I think our book did extremely well. I was talking to Hillary, Hillary Claggett. That's the, that's the, that's the editor we worked with. Um, yeah. And she's the one who contacted me about this. Uh, she's back at Prager now. Uh, um, but anyway, uh, she said Netroots Rising did um, extremely well. I mean, she's like, most books don't sell like 100 copies, 200 copies. This book sold 1,700. Yeah. That's, she said that's fantastic. So how many? Seventeen hundred. Yeah. And I and if for. They put it in paperback. It would have sold more. I know, but that's not their business model, and they're not. Uh, it's just not. But anyway, um, she, I said, why do you think that is? And she said, well, first of all, it's really well written, which I was like, okay, that's good. <laughs> I mean, I put a we put a lot of effort into it. And I worked with yeah. um, Bill Cloman a lot on on editing it. I mean, he, he did a great job. Um, yeah, he did. So and then and then she said she thought. Um, it was a topical. It was interesting, you know, and timely, and um, a good, uh, um, decent. That's first person reporting. There's stuff in there that nobody else has written. Right, and then uh, she also said that getting a uh, publicist, um, a lot. Of her, she said, in her experience, the authors that are most successful get get their own publicist or do some kind of publicity thing. That, yeah. You know, and we did, and I think that, I mean, I think that got us a few. Um, at least, uh, I don't know how many, but, and then Yosem was helpful, too. Although we didn't sell any books on that fucking Stanford thing, but whatever. I mean, yeah. but we got a free trip out to Stanford, at least, in Berkeley. Yeah, that was pretty cool. And, and Vanderbilt was cool. I don't know who got us that one, I can't remember, but, um. I think, was that our publicist, or was that? Might have been. I, I didn't get it. That's, I don't think. Oh, no, maybe one of them contacted me. No, 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 one of them emailed me. I think it was, right? Yeah. And, then, and then I responded. And I think that's what happened. No, so I don't know what our publicist got us. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, she, she helped us set up the book. The, 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 the website. Was. Well, we had the website, yeah. and then she, she might have helped us. Did she help us with politics and prose? or? Um... Yeah, yeah, she helped us with that. And that was kind of a dud. If we had done that the day it came out, you know, um, that would have been better. Because my Austin event, you should have been at my Austin event, because that was great, because I hadn't been in town for a long time. Oh, yeah. A lot of people. They wanted to see me, and you know, it was like packed, and I told a bunch of books. Yeah. Um, well, anyway, so, but yes, this. Um, the other thing is, I mean, to do a good job on this book, what? That's what I'm kind of most apprehensive about. I feel like I think I think the key thing is try to get as many original. The thing we had, the ace card we had, was we had first-person experience yeah, yeah. relevant things that we talked about. Right. And so I think you should try to find sources who lived it. Like, talk to, find some veteran reporters who got laid off and can tell you about the change in the news industry firsthand. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, I know some yeah. in Virginia, definitely. I mean, I've talked yeah. to Bob, like Bob Lewis. I don't know if you remember him, but I, I've had, I used to have conversations with him. He's now uh, not a journalist anymore. <laughs> of course not. Um, and I know some Texas, you know, ex-reporters that I could hook you up with. And, um, yeah. you know, you'd, you'd try to find somebody that, that was inside the cable news machine in some capacity. Um, right. The other thing I think I feel like I know it more is social media. Um, although I mean I'm not the expert on Facebook, but, but Yosem can help with that. Um, I mean, he, and and those Stanford people. I, I think you could also reach out to. Um, I'm sure there's some Clinton and Sanders operatives. You know, Tim DeGarce was big on the Sanders campaign. Mm -hmm. Zach Eckley was big on that. Um, uh, I bet you could get an interview with Peter Dow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, he's such an ass, but yeah, I don't know. Well, you know, they all are. I mean, that's, you know. Like, I know, I guess, yeah. <laughs> but they like, but that's part of why they want to be in a book or whatever. Um, yeah, but I mean, I, I think, I think Dow, uh, you know, I mean, he's a political hatchet, man. Of course he's an ass. That's his job, you know? Mm hmm. Um, but, uh, but I think he it could have some really interesting takes and also uh, some of the people that were named in that um, prop are not fake news thing. Right. Uh, and um, uh, that there's a fucking Pat Lang. Do you know who Pat Lang is? Colonel Pat Lang? No. He's a military blogger. He's got a site six, it's got the worst, it's like Turco, I'll send you the link to it. <laughs> it, it it's six Semper Tyrannus. And oh. this guy is like one of these people that just fascinates me. Oh, you know who you'd have to interview is Charles Johnson from Little Green Footballs, because he went from hard right wing to hard left wing. Yeah. And he's a great one to talk to. Mm -hmm. but, but talk to Pat Lang, because he's in Alexandria. He's a veteran military guy who was in the Middle East at a high level for like 20-something years. And his blog is like great to me, because it's one of the few places where I feel like I can get reasonably accurate news on Syria mm -hmm. that's not Russian propaganda and that's not American propaganda. I mean, he has his own axe to grind, you know, a yeah. lot of them. And he's super racist. He's like an old school Alexandria Confederate dude, you know? Yeah. And like, really hates Black Lives Matter and stuff, but He's somebody, I think, that has some real insight because he understands how the military propagandizes the press. Right. And and that's a real thing, you know, like, um, you know, like, you know, there's still more like the State Department, people in the State Department are proposing, like, oh, well, we should label fake news, you know? I mean, like, when, once the fake news meme was out, what happened was a lot of opportunists jumped on that fake news bandwagon to attack their enemies. Mm -hmm. Like, David Brock is out there saying, oh, we're going to make this fake news thing a big deal. And, like, what's his fucking agenda, you know? Mm -hmm. Because you know he's got one. And, right. uh Well, he wants to be a player. I mean, he wants... I, I don't know exactly what he wants, but he wants to be a media superstar, I'm sure, and well, he, political... Well, he and does and, and wants to control... What he wants to do, there's an opportunity to pressure Facebook and Google to throttle access to media. Because anybody that's in the media business right now, like from a Vox standpoint, Facebook changing their algorithm two years ago cost us a lot of fucking money. Mm -hmm. Because they turned the spigot off. They used to drive so much traffic mm -hmm. to our sites, and they just shut it off. And now if we want... We still make a lot of money and get a lot of eyeballs through Facebook on Facebook. We create all this video to put on Facebook. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Like the action is no longer getting people off of Facebook right. and back to our site. Well, they don't want to leave Facebook. They're like... They want. That they yeah. just it's a contained universe. People just live on there. They chat chat it's, with each other I, on there. Yeah. You know, it's it's the fucking monkey clicking the cocaine button. I mean I it really know is. what it is and I still find myself I know. I got a like. Well, oh my god, I got another like. Oh I'm so happy. Yeah. Or watching stupid videos. You know, like I'll be scrolling down the feed and or, yeah. you know, auto plane and I'm watching this one and now or, I'm watching uh, this one, you know, and it's like 
for, so, for these quizzes um, about, you know, how, um, you know, smart am I about, or how much do I know about Judaism or Christianity or how much do I, it's like, about quizzes, yeah. or, you because know, what's my, yeah. information and what's you listen to. If I was a movie star, who would I be? Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's so easy to get sucked into that shit. Or like Soren Dayton, you know, he's a Republican guy that I'm Facebook friends with. And he had some thing that, like, 